Friday at noon. Who wants to be here? So we really appreciate it. <laughs> we really appreciate it. My name is Eleni Bastea, and I'm the director of the International Studies Institute. And um, today we actually have the founding director of the International Studies Institute. That's Melissa Pokovoy, who also brought her class, uh, a professor and chair of the history department. And also, I want to introduce uh, Christine Sauer, who took the reins over from Melissa and uh, directed ISI for five years and um, is now primarily in charge of our major international studies. We have over 200 courses. I probably got the statistics wrong. 200. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and growing. growing. Also, we have um, more members in our team. Uh, Julie Williams is here. Uh, she's a graduate assistant and also a professor, a adjunct faculty in the English department, a PhD student. And Ken Carpenter is our um, adjunct instructor in international studies. Uh, Jasmine Knight um, holds everything together from her office, is our um, admin person. During the last five years, we've witnessed unprecedented upheavals that have pitted the principles of democracy, multiculturalism, and respect for human dignity against often intransigent political and religious positions. Concurrently, the economic crisis affecting several countries within the European Union and beyond has caused increased unrest within and beyond the EU. Speakers in this series, and there are 13 lectures altogether, have been addressing um, developments, um, uh, the, the crisis of modernity from the local to the multinational levels, comparing developments around the world, and examining problems and proposed solutions. And also what I've been learning from this lecture series is that we really cannot uh, um, perpetuate some kind of black and white division between uh, uh, countries in the first world, countries in the third world as the first ones having, first ones having the answers and the second ones having um, the questions and the problems. We are learning from each other and several of the speakers presented solutions that um, are coming out of countries in Africa um, yesterday we heard about Cuba and so on. So it's really a much more um, diverse and uh, complex um, interweaving, if you will, of uh, challenges and solutions. And um, since Tanya is here today, I also want to thank her for actually finalizing the title, Modern Societies and Rise and Global Challenges and Solutions. And uh, we hope that um, this series of lectures um, is enhancing our community's understanding of current political and economic upheavals and their effects in New Mexico and the Southwest. We're proud of the mix of UNM faculty, New Mexico scholars and activists, as well as scholars and participants from around the world who have, from around the US and the world, who have participated in this uh, series. We've had um, five, we have five UNM faculty presenting. The last one will be uh, Delia Alcantara on Monday at 12 here. And uh, three New Mexico experts, uh, three US-based scholars, and Nadia uh, presenting today is one of them, as well as two speakers coming from uh, foreign countries, Canada and China. We're especially thankful to the speakers who are uh, sharing their knowledge, their passion, their time, their research <coughs> with us, and um, they're the first ones I want to thank. And um, also within the university, we've had um, financial support and support of all sorts, moral, intellectual, and so on, from the Office of the Provost, um, the College of Arts and Sciences, University College, the Department of History, uh, Feminist Research Institute, and uh, the Peace Studies Program. Beyond the university, we're also thankful to the New Mexico Humanities Council and the 
NASA Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the Colorado European Union Center of Excellence and the European Union for helping sponsor this lecture series. And um, with that, uh, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce um, my colleague and friend, Tanya Ivanova from Foreign Languages and Literature, who will introduce the speaker. Thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Nadia Kravitz, uh, who received her PhD, it's rather Doctor of Philosophy, at the University of Oxford Department of Politics and International Relations, St. Anthony's College in 2012. Her dissertation dealt with the domestic sources of Ukrainian's foreign and security policies since independence and was funded by the IREX Title VIII program and the Open Society Foundation. She completed her BA in International Relations here in the States at San Francisco State University in 2005, but then left for England, for Oxford, to complete her uh, M uh, Master of Philology in Russian and East European Studies. Uh, she just shared with me that uh, she traveled to London when she was still an undergrad in the States, and she liked it so much that she decided to go to Oxford, what's not to like, right? <laughs> During 2011-2012, she was the Eugene and Daimon Shklar <coughs> Research Fellow at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, and the following year held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University, where she began the preliminary work on her second book project, now uh, called How Neighbors Managed Russia. Currently, Dr. Kravitz is the uh, GIC postdoctoral research fellow at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and a postdoctoral fellow at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard as well. She's completing her first monograph on Ukraine-Russia relations titled Missiles, Ships, and Pipelines, Domestic Politics of Ukraine's Foreign Policy. Join me in welcoming Dr. Kravitz. Thank you. First, let's do a sound check. Are we good? Excellent. I hope you can hear me all the way in the back. You are welcome to move forward, just so you can see me better and hear me better. Um, thank you very much, Tatiana, for introducing me. And I would like to join um, Eleni in thanking the sponsors, thanking the university administration for bringing me here, for allowing me to address this audience. Um, I would like to also thank Erica Monaghan, with whom I um, we were together at the Davis Center in 2012 when she was there finishing her book as well. So it was a great pleasure to meet her um, and introduced me to, to uh, New Mexico and talked about it very much. So I'm very excited to be here and I already saw some buildings and it's been, it's been great. So um, before I delve into the topic of our conversation and hopefully discussion today, I just wanted uh, to say a few things about myself that are uh, a bit more human, if you like. Uh, <laughs> human in a sense of personal. So yes, um, I was born in Ukraine. Um, my parents moved here in the 1990s and I came in 2000. Um, I had very strong English skills, so I didn't have any problems integrating really. Um, I finished high school here. I went to San Francisco State where I did a very broad degree on international relations. And I love to travel. I travel to many countries, um, partly because I studied well and, and uh, the California State gave me money and said, all right, you know, you can do things. And so I did them. I, I traveled to different places, including, um, including uh, Europe. On one of my trips during a winter break, I went uh, to London with a friend from Russia. And uh, we decided to hop on a, a bus called Oxford Tube. And, uh, and I ended up in Oxford and fell in love with the place. And I was planning already on doing my master's degree. So I was thinking, yes, I, I love to travel. I, ever, you know, I love everything about international relations. I'm concerned global citizen, and I want to do more. And I thought, well, I already know Russian. I know Ukrainian. I know German. Why don't I take that a notch further and do a sort of a master's specialized study in, uh, in regional studies? So I did the uh, master of philosophy, an MPhil degree of two years at the University of Oxford. I got accepted. I don't know why. Um, and here I am now as a postdoctoral fellow specializing or having a niche in, in the study of, of the post-Soviet space. I work on relations uh, of Russia with its former 
um, dominions uh, or its, with its periphery, countries of the former Soviet Union, um, and also relations with Russia with European Union or EU. So this is kind of where I'm coming from um, in speaking about it. And um, I want to premise the talk by saying that this has been a very difficult place and time to be as a scholar. Because of today, almost everybody is an expert on Ukraine and Russia. <laughs> today, almost everybody is an expert on what to do and the US should do in this conflict. But, and, and in part, it's because of the way in which information is delivered. And in part, because my question as a scholar is being questioned every day, given my background, given, given the fact that you, know, you have a PhD, that doesn't mean much. So um, many of you might hold these views, and there's nothing I can do about them. But um, I want you to take, if you, uh, if you like, a sort of a leap of faith, uh, faith in me and say that you know, I spend every day reading um, as much as I can from different sources Ukrainian speaking, Russian speaking, based in Russia, based in Ukraine, based in um, Europe, um, Western Europe, uh, based in, in, in US, trying to make sense of what is going on. Um, and so today's conclusions or ideas that I will share with you are about that, are basically conclusion of what I think about them. But I invite you in the Q&A to, to interrogate me, to, to discuss some of these um, um, arguments that I'll be making. And I do want to make sure that the, the conversation that I'm having with you is linked to this general theme of your lecture th series on the modern societies in crisis. And Ukraine is in crisis. It's, a, it's, a, it's in crisis of governance, and it is in a, in a, in a, a military crisis with, it, with its neighbor. So in a month, Ukraine will celebrate one year anniversary of its revolution, Maidan or Euromaidan revolution, depending on how you want to call it. And as Eleni has mentioned, one major global theme over the last several years has been the wave of revolutions of dignity, the Arab Spring, the revolutions now happening, or protests, mass mobilization protests that are happening in, in Hong Kong, previously also um, in Venezuela, we can talk about um, similar events in Brazil. These were all instigated by feeling of the population that the government is, is doing injustice to them in political terms, civil liberties, hum, human rights, and so on, and in economic terms, economic injustice. Here also we can link it to the, to the Occupy movement in the United States. Occupy movement was about economic injustice about the creation of certain oligopoly as perceived by American public that is running the American economic system. And these messages resonate of what the revolution in Ukraine was about. So despite the, what you might have heard on the media, the revolution was about these political and economic injustices that the Ukrainian population felt under the leadership of Viktor Yanukovych. So first, let's look at Ukraine just for those of you who are unfamiliar with the geography. Um, Ukraine is right here. Ooh. No, no. Let's see. You can press it up close together and then I think it's the top button. There you go. Oh, voila, working. Just so you know where Ukraine is located, in case those of you who don't know. So the major point that I want to, to, for you to take away from this discussion is that the Euromaidan movement was about um, a governmental crisis in Ukraine. Something that some of its causes were, or the reason why this governmental crisis occurred, were um, building over time, building over the last two decades of Ukraine's transition, where government was refusing to end economic and political practices <coughs> that started actually under the Brezhnev period and of the Soviet Union and lasted into modernity. Some of them were more particular, that is to say laws um, and governance that was passed or practiced under Viktor Yanukovych. So these are photographs that I've taken um, or from the Twitter during the Euromaidan revolution and in particular, the, the upper photograph or um, uh, twit was about 
him passing a laws during the social mobilization in Ukraine during mass protests um, that were called dictatorial laws. And following the dictatorial laws, um, there was another sort of wave of violence where protesters, especially students, were suppressed um, in December. And that brought over even larger waves of mobilization on the streets. So certainly tactics that he used weren't um, adequate to actually uh, disseminate the grievances. They made it worse. Um, this woman that's wearing a, um, uh, well, a collar. collar, basically, a uh, colander on her head, was another way of protest against these dictatorial laws that he was passing at the time. And this was sort of ridiculing uh, the law that said that you can't have any kind of helmet, any kind of protective gear over your head. <laughs> so he said, well, I'll put that on my, on my, on my head. So, um, and they were peaceful protests. I think one of the things that you notice when you just type in into Google search or any engine, you know, you're a Maidan or Maidan Revolution in Ukraine, it comes off a very violent. But certainly, it, that violence was very contained in a very small part of uh, Kiev on the two streets. That's pretty much it. The rest was pretty peaceful, and it was wide, widespread. So it wasn't about um, just Kiev. Protests were happening in all cities of Ukraine, including eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine and Crimea. They were smaller. And we can talk about, and I will talk about, some of the sociology who were the protesters. But nonetheless, I want you to understand that this was a broad uh, national movement, mass, mass mobilization movement, that took place um, at the time in the fall of 2013. So who were the protesters? Um, I'm using data from a, two colleagues of mine who carried out um, um, a survey um, on the spot, and they carried out over several days uh, when it was happening. Um, by Olga Ono, who's currently at University of Manchester, and Tamara Marciniuk, who is a sociologist from uh, Kyiv. Um, and I'll have the, those details a bit later. But what I want you to see here is, um, or draw your attention to some things that are unusual. So one of the things that we talked about, or at least the media has portrayed movement in Ukraine, or the uh, revolution in Ukraine, that was driven by the students and the younger population. Yes and no. They were part of the group. But what's surprisingly when you actually study the protest is that 69% were older than 30. Um, that 24% were older than 55. That actually a large chunk of protesters were older people, including pensioners. That this was a movement of highly, or people with higher education. 76% had higher education. These are also people who have, who have been employed. Um, large percentages of males, 59%. Interestingly, despite some of the perception that this was um, Western Ukrainian driven um, protest movement and majority by ethnic Ukrainian, that is those who speak Ukrainian, what you tend to find out is that when you do a, a survey is that 82% um, said the Ukrainian was their mother tongue but because Ukraine is a bilingual state, majority use Russian in everyday um, language in, at home and at work. So about 67% of those who were protesting on the streets used Russian, uh, um, used, um, used it at home or work, and the rest were bi uh, bilingual or Russian. Interestingly as well, something that was a um, uh, a theme that carried over from the Orange Revolution was saying that it would be the same people that went and participated in an earlier protests, like Orange Revolution or anti Kuchma campaign, which was in, in early 2000s. And Ukraine has actually a pretty strong history of social mobilization. Not large, mass mobilization that happened in Orange Revolution and now in, in Maidan, but nonetheless, protest activity has been quite strong all throughout the post Soviet period. And it's interesting that about 38% of those didn't come from those previous protests. These were new grievances, if you like, people with new dissatisfaction. Let's talk a little bit about why they protested. So again, this is building on this um, project. You can, you can Google it and uh, get the link. It will come out the results as an article soon, the Ukrainian Protest Project. An op-ed based on the results has been published in Washington Post. So again, if you type in Olga Onuch, um, who I think is a top-notch um, uh, researcher of social mobilization, not just in Ukraine, but also Argentina. She specializes in Latin America as well. Um, and this is, again, interesting, um, that 
these are some of the words that were used by the protesters about why they came out on the streets. So the students and the, and the youth, if you like, that were under 30, they came here for EU exception, global human rights, much more in line with sort of the global um, message that you like of the uh, Occupy movement in some way. Um, in the, when you go below, below 30, it has to do with economic security. It had to do with better opportunities for their children. It had to do with visa restrictions. And they wanted to live in a normal European democracy. Over 55, when they're as guardians of the protest, they say, well, my family, my kids can go because they're working, but I'm going to go and stand there for them because I want them to have um, um, better opportunities and better to live in a better country that I'm living in. And the interesting bit, or I think the way in which you can put this in the context, is that a lot of the media puts um, protests in Ukraine, revolution in Ukraine, in geopolitical terms. That it, for Ukrainian people, it's been about between Russia and EU. But for them, it's not about the geopolitics. It's about how do you live your everyday life. And when we talk about how you live your everyday life, the reason they, why the Ukrainian population, as we see through, through the eyes of the protesters, wanted Ukraine to associate itself more with the European Union, to approximate its laws and legislation on how you run business, what is the role of courts and rule of law in the country. It had to do with the practicalities of everyday life, where injustice is prevalent, where courts are bought um, by whoever has more money, where um, the entire economic system is run by a few groups of very wealthy people. And they wanted to destroy that system. Now they understood, and when you speak to the protesters, it really comes through, is that over the last two decades they've tried this reform by themselves and hoped that the government would fight corruption and fight all of these injustices by themselves. But it hasn't worked. So when this prospect of the EU integration came about, they saw it as an instrument to get Ukraine in order. So you have to understand that EU approximation and being with the EU has to do with changing Ukraine from within so that they can find themselves and live a more comfortable life. So again, I want you to remove yourself from this geopolitical thinking and put yourself into the shoes of everyday Ukrainian who has to deal with these corrupt practices. And when you see this beacon of hope being the EU for many of them, and many of them younger, more educated, those who are in the, in the professional life, they say this is a way to do it because Ukrainian politicians, elites, are unwilling and have very little political will to do this on their own. So we need this external mechanism to help us do it domestically, to put laws into practice that will, over time, nobody expected this or still expects this to happen overnight, but over time bring Ukraine and make it a more normal country. So how has this reflected in the rest of the regions? if you like, because we're here, we just talked about the protesters themselves and what they wanted. And I want to now invite you to think about the rest of Ukraine. Majority of, um, again, media and also pundits have put Ukraine into a divide to say there is a East Ukraine and West Ukraine or other regions. For the purposes of sociology in Ukraine, for example, the majority of polls divide Ukraine into these four regions of West, Center, <coughs> East and South. So I want you to think about them as, as um, I'll be discussing some of this data. So I'm pulling here a survey that conducted by Kiev International Institute of Sociology, which is an equivalent of a Levada Center, if for those of you who are familiar with the Russia's top polling service. Um, they work together all the time. Um, and I invite you to go on their website. They have lots of interesting polls and data, and it's really great for debunking a lot of myth about what Russians think or Ukrainians think or whatnot, um, to kind of get a perspective on, on that. So this is Ukraine by macro regions, and they want to try to understand um, why, uh, why basically the, why they were protesting, why were the, uh, the Maidan revolution happening. So if you see on eastern and southern regions of Ukraine, we can talk about why, but I want to bring in the data, eastern and southern regions of Ukraine believe, quite a large chunk of it, believe that influence of the West that aims to include Ukraine in the sphere of political interest is the reason for why, so geopolitical argument for why the protest was happening. If you look at the macro regions of uh, 
uh, Western and Central, that it's really the outrage against corruption that is sort of the dominating um, explanation, plus aim Ukraine to make Ukraine as a civilizing European country. Okay? But you also note that the outrage for corruption was quite high in Eastern and Southern too. Again, um, on which side were the majority of the population? This is a national survey about 2000, which is a very normal statistical measure. So what do we see here? Again, in the, sorry, it's coming off. No? I think the battery might be giving in. Okay. Um, so what we see on the side of the authority of Yanukovych in southern and eastern regions of Ukraine, 30, 59 percent. And the high is actually in eastern, not in the southern regions. Now by this time, this poll already excludes Crimea. Crimea was already annexed. Um, interestingly, only a very large percent in eastern and th southern um, regions or provinces of Ukraine weren't on either side of the protesters, were quite neutral in what was happening. So this can give you an idea of what the different parts of Ukrainian population in these different regions, macro regions, were thinking. Some breakdown on um, women and male. Again, on this, we see that on the side of the protesters, males are largely or higher percent. Um, on the side of the Yanukovych women, which is kind of interesting, it's a small percent difference, but nonetheless interesting. And I have a few more indicators um, by age and by education. And again, I want to draw your attention to the education level. Um, so we will see that, again, higher educated people will be either on the side of the protesters or on none of the side. OK? So this is, again, a national representative um, results. So. The reason why I wanted to start with the revolution and discuss it is because something was happening in Ukraine and still is where a large part of the population has, if you like, rebelled against the old established order. Okay? And they rebelled, and if you talk to people who do literature or humanists, they will say the revolution was about change of values, that they wanted to live in a country um, cross-regionally, those who are higher, with higher education or more highly educated wanted to create a different kind of country. And it didn't matter that they spoke Russian, they didn't matter that they were ethnic Russian. They were beginning to see themselves as Ukrainian in a very civic national term, not in a, um, on a, a sort of nationalist eth ethnic term, which is what oftentimes happens in, when you discuss Ukraine and Ukraine's regional divisions that oftentimes it's said that it's about pro-Russians. Well, who are these pro-Russians? And when you try to understand who they are, it's actually not by ethnic definition, not by the language that they speak, but has more to do with levels of education perhaps that they had, has more to do with what kind of media they're watching. So, and, and media I really want to bring into attention because when I try to understand and explain this regional variation, if you like, and you can see it when you look at some other polls because they are consistent, is that depending on what kind of media the population was watching, were they watching Russian media or Ukrainian state control or regime controlled media during the Maidan protests, they have a very different vision of what the protests were about. They saw them as, you know, this coup d'etat, neo-Nazi fascists taking over Kyiv. Whereas if you watch different kind of media or if you actually were following events on the ground from alternative media sources, you saw events in a very different light. You saw this as this um, revolution of dignity that I've been arguing. So how did this revolution of dignity, which one could argue is a very noble undertaking and that should have been supported by all of the neighbors, including by Russia, how did this revolution within Ukraine turn into, into an um, undeclared war between Ukraine and Russia? 
And here I want to emphasize or deal with mainly two dynamics or two, um, two themes. One has to do with internal Ukrainian dynamics, which has been brought up as an argument by the Russian side, that this is a genuine movement of separatism. So the war in eastern uh, Donbass, as well as in, in Crimea, have been movements, if you like, of genuine separatism. And I would counter and say that they were not. Maybe Crimea had possibility of being that movement and has much more legitimacy to claim potentially in this light. But if we talk about how it was carried out, if we're talking about how the referendum was carried out under arms and under weapons um, or with the use of weapons, then certainly any kind of um, genuine separatist movement in my eyes is not legitimate. And the reason why I want to talk about it is that to bring you this data, which basically the, the darkest um, provinces with the, with the darkest blue are the ones that throughout from 1995 answered in a poll question that they wanted to unite with Russia. So if these eastern provinces in 1995 uh, of Luhansk and Donbass, which are on the far, far east, and Crimea, were scoring between 30 and 60%. So 60% was in, in Crimea, about 30% was in, in Luhansk and Donbass uh, regions. By 2013, this is poll was taken in September, they're taken regularly in September, every September, same question. By 2013, Luhansk and Donetsk grew towards, 80, uh, towards 18%, while Crimea stayed at 32 This is right before the events erupted on Maidan. So that gives you an idea about how much political or power base would any domestic separatist movement actually have. Okay? So when we're talking about 2013, all right, so let's think Crimea about 32 and, and Luhansk and, and, and Donetsk provinces where currently hostilities are taking place, about 18%. One could argue, and I would agree with that, that because of the Maidan revolution and because of the way in which media, including Russian media and Ukrainian pro-regime media, have portrayed Maidan, it probably brought those numbers up, right? So this is the same poll question and they show it in, um, through the different years from 2008 to uh, 14, the latest being conducted in February 2014. And again, you can see this particular question that I mapped on those maps, um, that Ukraine and Russia must unite into a single state. And you see that that percent has been decreasing and, gr and, and, and falling. Majority of Ukrainians still want, after everything, with Russia to have a normal close relations with no borders, potentially no visas, and friendly states. What you also see is that over the years, and it especially stark are the numbers if you look at them from 1995 that I showed, is this idea of, um, which I already mentioned, Ukraine must unite into a single state. If we're now talking national 12%, it used to be much higher than that on a national level. I'm going to talk about southeastern regions now as well, answering this question. So this uh, specific question was, was given only to the residents of the east and, and uh, southern macro region. And again, very interestingly, the what kind of a support, and this was already conducted in April, Okay, so we can talk about what was the effect of Maidan on this, if you like, uh, power base for genuine separatism. And the highest support for that kind of separatism is in the two regions that are currently, where currently hostilities are taking place, in Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, so certainly I do want to 
uh, secede from Ukraine and join Russia. In the Donetsk region is 11.9%, in Luhansk region 13.2, the highest. Rather, yes, 15% in Donetsk, 17% um, in Luhansk. For those difficult to say, we can you know, decide on where we'll put them. But you know, those who certainly want, in both of these regions you see about 30% desire, which is consistent with some of those polls that I showed you earlier in 2013. So really that percent of a power base hasn't really changed. So again, one of the takeaways that I want you to have from, from my conversation with you is that the data does not support any kind of a broad-based genuine separatist movement controlled by the majority. It certainly exists, but it's not if we're talking about establishment of democratic principles where the majority would want to have um, to secede from the country, it certainly doesn't exist. So I would argue that this movement, also in Crimea by and large, the reason why it happened so quickly in Crimea is because of the disinformation campaign. And the reason why they had to carry it out quickly was because if people actually understood what took place in Kyiv, they would probably go along with a lot of its demands and support it rather than oppose it as they did. That is majority residents of Crimea. So what I would argue is that the movement, especially the armed conflict, and we're talking here not about some little rebels that are running around with you know, AK-47, which, okay, is, is, not, is a sophisticated weapon, but not so much. We're talking about rebels that have very sophisticated um, tanks, anti-tank missiles, book systems, and others, um, this kind of conflict could not have taken place without direct support of the Russian government, operational, military, and financial. And results of this will be coming and forthcoming uh, in terms of supporting my argument. What I know is from what I read and understand and analyze, but certainly there are lots of scholars now from all over the world looking into it and, and trying to look at the evidence. And uh, books on this and articles will soon become available that I think will corroborate my story. So what was happening really until the beginning of August in this conflict zone was a very much a covert, uh, covert type of war. And it became overt over time with the beginning of August. So although a major international debacle took place uh, at the end of August, um, August 24th around Ukrainian independence is where there was a real scare in Washington that Ukraine and Russia are going to head to head with the appearance of Russian green, little, green men or little green men um, without insignia in Mariupol and other areas of, of conflict. And I'll show you those in, in the map shortly. Um, it's starting to be more overt at the end of August. And why? Well, the reason is very simple. Ukrainian anti-terrorist operation, as they call it, was getting successful. So you can see the reduction of the red areas that is rebel controlled parts of Luhansk and Donetsk regions. So that's another um, territorial uh, message that I want to send is that the, the, these areas are not entire regions are controlled and not retire uh, provinces. It's parts of those provinces that are being controlled. So um, this is um, June. Uh, uh, we start with the beginning of June 16th. Uh, so July 17th, you have the downing of, of the Malaysian airline. Um, and then just visually, you see the red areas being reduced. Okay? And what Ukrainian army was succeeding, and um, volunteer battalions as well, is closing the border. So the major reason for what they wanted to do is to encircle the rebel forces and cut them from the supplies from, from the Russian side. Well, um, the Russian government very well understood what was happening and tried to counter it by opening a new front. So a new front in the war was open in this area, Mariupol area, which is a key strategic port in Ukraine. Um, they haven't taken Mariupol currently. Mariupol is uh, in defense mode. They're anticipating possibly uh, an attack. But nonetheless, this area that was taken at the time was to open up another front and to um, to send a signal to Ukrainian government as well that this will be a bigger war than they anticipated. So since then, what really happened? Um, things escalated up until September 
uh, 5th when a ceasefire was signed. Ceasefire, um, following it, another memorandum. Uh, there have been a number of meetings between uh, President Putin and President um, Poroshenko, Ukraine's president. Low-level fighting continues every day. Somebody dies or is injured every day. Uh, but it is considered, for now, a ceasefire, although how long that will take will depend on whether the troops, or the rebel troops, or Russia-supported troops, will move on to several key areas, including Mariupol, which I already mentioned, which is up here, and Donetsk Airport, which is, again, for those of you who follow what's happening currently, Donetsk Airport is an is a area of contention. If Donetsk Airport is taken, then potentially the Western world will say ceasefire is not working. And Ukraine is very much locked into deciding how to call things on the ground or how to react by the position of the EU and the United States. So we cannot, even if, if you look at the map, they have gained much more area during the ceasefire or the rebels have retaken and taken some new territory since the beginning of ceasefire. Ukrainian government cannot do anything in this situation because it is constrained by what West is allowing it to say or not to say in this conflict. So if Donetsk airport is, is taken, as EU leaders have signaled, then they will consider that the ceasefire is not working and there will be another escalation of violence between these sides. So I would proposition to you that really the Russian government controls the intensity and the survival of this movement. Um, Russian leadership is waiting for the outcome of the parliamentary elections that are forthcoming on October 26 in Ukraine. And it, it is looking to see whether the survival of the party of regions, and there are two parties that are going into the party, parliamentary elections that are sort of representatives of the ancient regime. It's the opposition bloc and um, Silna Ukraina, or strong Ukraine. And they want to see whether these pro-Russia leaning politicians that are also connected to Russian businessmen, whether they'll be able to succeed in winning any substantial part of the electorate and to regain their control, if you like, in the parliament and in the localities from where they're running. Okay? So if I was betting on whether we'll see the escalation of this conflict happening, I'd say let's look at after the elections what would be the results. That will determine what the position of the Russian government will be on resolving or not resolving or continuing it in the status quo. So the, the second reason that I wanted to address um, that has less to do with you know, this internal dynamics in Ukraine but has more to do with the external and Russian perceptions um, and motives in Ukraine, which I think are very important to discuss if we're to uh, get to a broader theme of why is Russia reacting to it as it did, why, is, why did the Russian uh, regime or government reacted to the Maidan revolution by annexing Crimea and by going after Eastern Donbass? And I will say that there are two main reasons for it, and none of them is superior of the other, and, and they should be understood in symbiosis. And most of you probably have heard of them, and I'll just try to articulate them or bring them into, into uh, a sort of clear light. Um, one is you must understand the policy of the Kremlin vis-a-vis -vis the near abroad over the last two decades. If you study what the Russian government, sometimes not very effectively, sometimes you know, the foreign ministry will do something while the Ministry of Economy does something completely different, but that had to do with the internal structure of Russian government in the 90s rather than uh, necessarily motives. So declaratively and vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis certain policy actions, the general line towards the republics have been to try to maintain them and bring them into, back into Russian control. It was suffering from this post-imperial syndrome. And this is how Moscow today is perceiving itself in many ways. It is a former empire that collapsed, that is at the moment trying to reconstitute itself. But it sees that it's necessary to control this area around it, both for security, sometimes for ideational reasons, because they're Russian citizens who are living in there, as in, in, or the Russian compatriots, which is an interesting category that I can come back to later. 
but that this policy has been consistent, and that is to undermine and deny full sovereignty to these post-Soviet republics, even if they want the same thing. So say Georgia and Ukraine wanted to join WTO very quickly. The Russian position would be sure. You can join WTO, but join with us. Or let us join first, and then you can join. Makes no sense, right? Rationally, both were moving in the same direction. Rationally, both wanted the same economic gains from the processes. But it had to do with the status. It had to do with much more emotions and, and, and that sort of thing. And the idea of denying full sovereignty, including Ukraine, but as I said, um, it's very much applicable to the rest of the post-Soviet republics, had to do with this imperial past. Some call it neo-imperial. I, I still think it's a, it's a post-imperial syndrome. Um, but it wasn't applied everywhere in the same way. Ukraine was a special case and remains a special case for the making of Russian identity, in part because current construction of Russian identity has to do with locating it or, or locating its beginnings in the Kievan Rus, in the capital of present-day Ukraine. And unless that history is revisited, and Russia's history is far more complex and interesting, as I'm sure it, Erica would agree, um, if you unmake that history, then potentially you can make it into a very different power, into a very different empire, perhaps much more acceptable to today's, today's Ukraine. But what uh, Russian leadership has, is to den uh, has done is denied um, to Ukrainian leaders and Ukrainian public as well the very right to exist in a way, that Ukraine does not exist in this state as a state. Um, so how, what were some of the tactics I want to illustrate? And again, this comes through when you start reading literature, um, primary literature and, and empirical research on what Russian policy has been towards near abroad over the last two decades. And we, we, we will, what I want to premise it by saying is that these tactics were used, sometimes effectively, sometimes not, throughout both Yeltsin period and the Putin period. What changed in the Putin period is that it wasn't applied to everything. It was only applied to the most strategic decisions that, for example, either Ukrainians or Georgians wanted to do. Say they wanted to reorient their um, economic system. That had to be cut down because that would not be in line with Russia's greater strategic interests. So if you like, they have stopped using the various weapons, political, economic, that they had for every kind of disagreement they might dislike about the periphery and how it's behaving and applying it very, very um, specifically. So political and financial support of politicians in Ukraine with a pro-Russian ideology. So whenever you hear these reports that are cited about US aid, uh, USID giving money to Ukraine and financing the protests, I just invite you to try to find information on how much Russian government and Russian parties have been giving to polit politicians in Ukraine. Communist Party, um, Party of Regions. When you start asking those questions, then the numbers become much more interesting or this argument loses, loses its validity. Um, under Putin, what we also saw is a much more direct backing of authoritarian leaders in Ukraine and, and much more overt support of them. So aligning almost his own political future with the leaders, with this so perceived authoritarian leaders in Ukraine. So we had that, so we saw that in, during the Kuchma in his late term. We saw that during um, Yanukovych, who was the incumbent, so this alliance with, with the authoritarian leaders in Ukraine and political financing of them, some say also financial, so the provision of political technologists to Ukraine. Um, you know, anecdotal evidence that I don't necessarily bring out my book, but you would find when you start speaking to people who were working in the administration at the time of presidents in Ukraine, that you'd see, you know, Russian FSB running around like it's their, their state basically in the office and so on. These are anecdotal evidence, but nonetheless it tells you something about the degree to which Russia wasn't really pursued as a threat, but instead invited to take part in, in, um, in the running of the country, if you like. Um, huge, and this is something that I will come through in my book once it's out, hopefully this year, um, undermine Ukraine's energy diversification strategy and diversification efforts in general. We're talking about pipelines that could have reduced Ukraine's dependence on the supply of oil from Russia, 
that was scrapped down in 2003. And, a, and a, as I will show it in my book, and I then invite you to hopefully buy it, um, how incredible that intervention was, how public in a way that intervention was into really making sure that this strategic pipeline called Odessa Brode wouldn't flow uh, to supply um, oil from potentially Caspian through tankers into Western Europe, but instead was used by Russian companies and still is um, some of it at least to uh, Mediterranean customers and through to Russian, basically used by the Russian operators. Um, important role also in, in Russian tactics, if you like, of subversion of not just Ukraine but, but other post-Soviet republics has been the role of Russian Orthodox Church, which is um, become much more political than it used to be, even in Ukraine. Um, and again, you see that through the way in which elections, for example, take place in Ukraine uh, at the time under Yanukovych government, how priests would come out and say, you know, vote for this guy. Um, how Patrick Kirill himself has certain geopolitical messages that he carries out in Ukraine and towards, towards it. Um, so he certainly, I would argue, or the church itself became much more political and much more closer, moving to becoming a tool of the Kremlin. Probably tool is a bit of a stronger word, but nonetheless being used in this greater or grander Russian policy. Um, and important then, and to understand also that um, Russian parties, but also uh, various um, oligarchs like Konstantin Malafiev, uh, who's quite well known in Russia, have been supporting very interesting separatist groups in a lot of post-Soviet states, uh, especially movements by a guy called Alexander Dugin and his Eurasianist movements. And some of these um, groups, and we know that they were financed by them, have operated there, I would say it's in about 2010, sometimes it predate them. But really 2010, you see this larger movement of financing from Russia, I wouldn't call it from Kremlin, but from the Russian political uh, sort of uh, groups, if you like, um, and business into financing these separatist organizations that today actually operate in some of these areas that I already highlighted and they were operating in Crimea and so on. So an example would be Atpor in, in, in Crimea, in, in uh, Kharkiv, for example. But there are plenty of them. And you can find there's plenty of evidence of them having meetings in Crimea, sort of nationalist groups getting together, or neo-fascists, whatever you want to call them. Some of them are. Um, so this has been ongoing. Um, it didn't start in 2000. This is something that's been there for a while. Um, so, so one reason, as I said, has been this inability to let Ukraine go and to, for Ukrainians to, um, to move in a way that they want to move. And why is that the case? Well, so I have said that part of it is this geopolitical understanding of this periphery and us being a great power and us being the Russian, uh, the Russian government wanting to restore that great power status that it lost with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. And the one way in which they see that happening is to establish the sphere of influence. This idea of realpolitik that is a great power, you've got to have a sphere of specialized um, interest around you. Somehow that is very much as part of his mind. Whether that's necessary or not to be a great power today is a question. Do we really need, or does one really need a Monroe Doctrine to be a great power? Um, that's maybe something we can talk about. But nonetheless, that is one of the thinking on, uh, along the lines of which um, these policies vis-a-vis -vis the near abroad in Ukraine have been carried out. The second is domestic. And I'm sure that you have heard of it, and I'll just repeat it, but it's very interesting to investigate the reaction of the Kremlin to the Orange Revolution, um, to the Tulip Revolution, to the Rose Revolution in Georgia um, that happened in uh, 2003, 4, 6, is that they were viewed as 
not just unacceptable, but as a very existential threat to the regime in Russia, that these revolutions will spread to Russia. And you have to understand that in the Russian political thinking, um, a current perception, none of these revolutions are understood as driven by people, by you and I, by anyone who disagrees with the regime. In the minds of, of, um, of Russian political elite today, um, that sort of agency does not exist in, in the people. They very much view that these movements were financed by the United States. There is no other question. Movements like that don't happen on their own. That might have something to do with um, authoritarian cultures, Erica and I were discussing this morning. It might have something to do with Putin's own understanding, um, coming as a KGB guy or coming from security services, how media was manipulated in the Soviet Union, um, how humans were manipulated in the Soviet Union. The whole system was a system and designed by mind, not by nature, in his mind, uh, in the mind of those who worked in the Soviet government. So um, this very much uh, a, a desire to not acknowledge the power of agency and individual is something that comes through whenever you read any of the speeches or try to understand and discuss with them why do they not accept the fact that people in Kyiv can can by themselves come out on the streets and say we don't want this government and we want to overthrow it or change it or reform it or at least just view our grievances. And that came home especially strongly when people came out on Bolotnaya Street in 2011 after the, um, the announcement that these elections are, that Putin basically is returning for another term. This was fear. This was a genuine fear that not just him, but this entire system that he has created of economic and political interest, that this would be destroyed. Destroyed not by people, but by foreign governments. And I think it is sort of this genuine belief that um, Western technology and Western influence is what these movements are about. So fundamentally, if you will have Ukraine that succeeds in the Maidan movement, that becomes more European in the, in the sense of working rule of law, um, working institutions of the free market, where you don't have to support certain giants that then you use as personal pockets, um, talking about Gazprom and Rosneft, um, that maybe that will be such a huge demonstration effect on Russia that then that would threaten the regime. That's actually what majority of political scientists who are uh, more or less not touting the government line in Russia think. They very much agree that all of these reactions to Maidan and the war both in Crimea and then the reaction to Donbass, have been about domestic internal dynamics, less about geopolitics. I think that both are present at the same time. So, you know, in order to answer the question that um, why the Maidan movement in Ukraine has turned into, into a war, into undeclared war, I'd say that we need to turn to understanding these two factors in order to answer it. So I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Oh, what yeah. I forgot to announce before is that, first of all, this would, have, would not have been possible without Erika Manikman's help, who um, invited or uh, proposed that we invite Nadia and actually worked out all the details uh, and so on. And um, Erika Manikman, who teaches in the history department, will uh, be the first commentator and then we'll uh, field the questions. Do you want a chair? <laughs> oh, thank you. So uh, thank you, thank you so much for um, such a talk with so much information and gives us so much food for for thought. I my, so I've been asked to moderate, maybe comment and moderate a little bit. What I'm going to do is try and really rein in my impulse to comment because I know there's so many people here in the audience who have terrific questions, but maybe I will reserve for myself a right to um, to ask some questions at the end of um, myself. Um, but before I do that, let me just kind of say, you know, again, thank you for this very informative talk. Um, you've given us so much to think about. I am so, I am so struck by this um, remark that uh, the Kremlin doesn't allow people to have agency and just how much it resonates with, um, with themes my class in our Soviet history are talking right now between this connection between 
individual's consciousness and propaganda, the links between it, and, and your remarks kind of resonate with that. I'm also struck by the, the many different levels at which this conflict needs to be addressed to be understood. There is the local level in terms of quotidian aspirations and perspectives, and there is the national level in a very diverse country, as well as the geopolitical um, level. And you know, thank you for this remark in, with respect to a relationship with EU for many Ukraine, Ukrainians on the ground was never about Europe as much as an instrumental vehicle to creating the life people wanted in Ukraine. Um, of course, the kind of big question on people's minds is, you know, what's going to happen? But because, um, you know, one Harvard professor who will remain nameless in early December said, the, the protests will likely be crushed or petered out. Um, a, well, a prominent German political scientist um, in January said, Ukraine's, in the, in the territorial integrity of Ukraine is under in question by no one um, because, you know, the USA's Tim Snyder himself, uh, third, what, less than two weeks before Khodorkovsky was released from prison, he said that Khodorkovsky will live out his days in prison. Um, so given that so many experts have gotten it wrong, I won't ask you where it's going to go next. Um, but the question, I will here, I haven't resisted asking one question. As you all know, I'm a historian. And yet, I've, I've heard this remark made that you know, at this point, it actually, we could talk about history a lot, the diversity, the past, the different traditions on which Ukraine draws, but at this point, it isn't so much about history as about energy and transport issues. So maybe, um, maybe you can table that and hold on to it, but how would you respond to that question? to me, don't worry about offending me, the historian, mm. that, it, that it isn't about history anymore. But with that, let me open it up to the audience and start taking some questions. Um, let me take, we'll take Santiago and then Maria. So you mentioned a uh, Monroe Doctrine, and um, I was wondering, does Russia feel that it's uh, safe from the European Union by creating this uh, doctrine of, uh, of republics defend itself, or does it feel that it needs those, uh, it needs that type of barrier? Well, I say the current political leadership in Russia thinks in, along those lines. So the mental map of how the world works is like that. Whether it is adequate to bring 18th, 19th century thinking into 21st century, where great power is defined by different things other than direct control, but rather creating a model that would be likable. Um, I think that's the biggest question and the biggest critique from those in Russia who like to have Russia being a normal great power. And by normal, they don't define it in this coercive ways. They'd argue, create a system within Russia that attracts Ukrainians, Georgians, etc., that attracts them to your political model, to your economic model. And the interesting bit is that Russia actually had the opportunity to do that if it successfully carried out, and it still has that opportunity, modernization within the country, t transforming it from this petro state, and shedding this idea that you can impose a will on somebody other. I think that's what you see when you again begin to study this, their interaction as a center with the peripheries and how it's treating them. Um, even Yanukovych hated his meetings with Putin. Uh, again, not because they didn't have a lot to talk about or agreement, but because of just the treatment of the Russian political uh, negotiators or negotiators in general who would come through is very derogative to them. Um, removing or give, uh, uh, disregarding any kind of, uh, or respecting them uh, really as representatives of these states. And you know, if you comment me, I think that Russia as a state could have received far more or greater results if it behaved normally towards these republics, respected them, bowed to them, um, and internally developed in a way that would be economically attractive for people. And I think if these things were made, there would be no need for a coercive Monroe Doctrine. It would have been created automatically because there's a lot of goodwill between the people. The problem here is not in, in, uh, in animosity between the Russian population and the Ukrainian population today, it's much higher. But even after all the conflicts, people in Ukraine will tell you, and the polls actually show this, that they do not see the Russian people as their enemy. They see the Russian regime as their enemy. So I think that's, you know, 
that's the, uh, if, if I answer your question correctly, yes, they believe it is, a, uh, it is justifiable. Um, and it has to do not even the 19th century, but I would argue that Russian Empire, and this is to a historian, what I think interesting about historically about Russian Empire is that it hasn't developed in the way that we think of British Empire or Spanish Empire or Portuguese. They weren't empires built on security. They were empires built on economies. They expanded abroad because they needed markets. Russia expanded, in my view, and maybe Erica would you know, disagree, but I think when you read it the way that I read Russian history, is it expanded because of the need of security, uh, security and the territory for the sake of security. And I think fundamentally that is still lingering in the mental map of today's leader, including, including Putin, who reads these historians, who reads the works of Berdyaev and believes that that's going to be the fundamental way in which Russia should develop or not. So I think um, that's where it's coming from, not, not necessarily because US does it, although that, that's present in, in Putin's rhetoric when he addresses uh, this question, but rather because of this also tradition that has existed, um, existed in, in the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union as well. What is your new book called? Pardon? Your book? So book will be called um, Missile Ships and Pipelines. Um, I know. But that's what, the, um, what it is about, domestic politics of Ukraine's foreign policy. Thank you. What do you think needs to be done that the Euromaidan movement succeeds eventually and not runs into corruption or sand like the Orange Revolution did? You know, there was a revolution of dignity in Ukraine in 2004 with terrible results. And so this is like a second wave. So what should go differently so there will be some success in Ukraine? So what was the problem with the Orange Revolution is you had a, I wouldn't say that it completely failed. It was a way in which prepared, and it was building on other protests that happened before, and it was about learning. So actually, some of the networks that were present in, in, in Maidan were some of the things that they used on the Orange Revolution. They are linked in a way that they developed. What's interesting about why they, what, and some of the successes that were, you know, much more freer media, for example, and um, there was a taste of freedom, economic freedom, in the immediate few years of, of Orange Revolution, that gave people an answer saying that what Yanukovych is doing is not acceptable. We can live in a different way. Do you see what I mean? So there were legacies of the Orange Revolution that told people we can live differently and there are other politicians that could do it differently. So that's important to remember. But you bring up a very important point because it's been now seven months since the coming of the new government, if you like, in Ukraine, and not a lot of reform has been done. And the reason for that is, is that Two factors. One is that war is certainly distracting. It's distracting politicians who don't have enough time to deal with everything. And they're not the most competent ones. The second major reason, actually three reasons, the second major reason is that you have a very much a non-workable parliament. That's why a lot is banking right now, or a lot of people and reformers are banking on the change in the government, in the parliament. Because in Ukraine's current uh, political system, the parliament needs to pass the laws in order for president to ratify it and make it into a law. But the current parliament has uh, about half of the deputies that were elected still under the Yanukovych regime that supported the, the introduction of dictatorial laws that basically went along the lines with Yanukovych during the protests, although they could have stopped it earlier and stopped the bloodshed earlier. So these deputies are still there and they're blocking a lot of the, some of the most important reform um, um, reforms and reform, reform, reform packages. For example, judiciary reform is completely wiped out. Uh, and that's the number one thing that one needs in order to, to bring more rule of law is to establish some independency of the courts in Ukraine. That law was not passed. So, um, so that's kind of a, another institutional reason, if you like, for some, why some of these reforms have not happened. But there's a third one, and the third is bureaucracy. Bureaucracy in Ukraine is very, very strong, as it is in many states. And this bureaucracy does not want to reform. It still lingers from the Soviet times in the way that departments are organized, in the way that there is just a ridiculous amount of officials that are not doing even half the job that they needed to do. 
Um, incredible inefficiency in decision making, especially when you need to reform. So let's say uh, you have to go to seven ministries in order to get something sort of um, vetoed in a way in order for it to even to be introduced into the parliament. So the whole system is hugely ineffective and it, has, and it goes through several rounds. So the bureaucrats who, doesn't want, who don't want to lose any power in this process are blocking the system. So they would take like months to review one uh, propositional law. And then there's an, another second review after all of the ministries have done it. And this is done purposefully. So, um, and there has been the lack of political will within the current government, who's kind of competing a bit with the president as well. Government, by that I mean the cabinet of ministers. Um, and so you have this blocking of reform within the bureaucracy. So what needs to be done, so what needs to be done is, well, for one, um, both, so I see this process as trifold in Ukraine, if it's going to happen quickly, and it needs to happen quickly. There is no more chance that Ukraine will get. Otherwise, if this uh, war effort continues, it will simply destroy the state. It wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say disintegrate, but it would destroy the state and its institutions, and it would lose, if we're talking about success of Maidan movement, all of these processes that we're talking about, or all of those hopes that they wanted to accomplish. So they need to be carried out quickly. So the one thing is the parliamentary elections, is to enable institutionally a better passing of law. So say I'm a president of Ukraine, um, I can come there if my party in unity or in coalition with several others forms a government that is much more in line with what I want to do, that we actually do it, all right? So you need to have a political will on all levels of governance in order to push through these reforms. Second, you need a very strong and vibrant civil society to remind what needs to be done and what's not being done. Now that is actually where the progress has been the most. Uh, there have been a number of very strong um, reformers from the civil society who have entered the government, saw that they are moving nowhere because of this bureaucratic politics, and stepped out and said, again going into the critical role um, that they've been at and saying, we. Um, don't support what's being done, it's not being done for X, Y, and Z. So exposing reason for why, for why reforms are not happening. So in that regard, they're doing a good job, and they need to continue doing that. The third element is the international community, and it again has gotten in a lot better in helping and emphasizing what needs to be done in terms of reform in Ukraine, and linking that to any kind of financial aid that it's providing or any kind of loans that it's extending. So they need to work in unison in order to actually deliver, in a very short period, a very drastic economic and political reform, governance reform in Ukraine. So I think what needs to be done is understood within Ukrainian population, but fighting these elements which I have highlighted, including very much organized business groups and interest, who do not want to lose their power. Some of them are afraid, how are they going to operate in a system where they don't hold that power any longer? So they're still trying to hold on to it. I hope I answered your question. Um, first of all, thank you for the lecture. Um, what do you think the chances are of Ukraine diversifying their energy sources in the future? Very good question. So interestingly, they began the diversification campaign under Yanukovych, uh, trying to build a LNG plant in Odessa. And it's been mirrored in tons of corruption reports. Um, they moved somewhat in it. So the platform's there. A lot of networks and um, um, some of the agreements have already been signed with several American companies to lease um, uh, some of the equipment and so on. The thing is that any kind of diversification takes time. What Ukraine has done up to date because of the current problems in the energy sector with Russia, um, effectively uh, the Gazprom stopped supplying gas to Ukraine, not transit to Europe, but gas to Ukraine, um, I think March or May, I'm forgetting here. But um, so what Ukrainians have been doing with the help of the EU, because Ukraine is part of the energy community with the European Union, they've signed up to um, the um, several energy packages that will approximate and basically link and integrate Ukraine's energy system in general with that of the EU. And they've done some progress on it, but not effective. And not effective not because of the EU, but because of these domestic reforms that we're talking about and the reason for why they haven't taken place. Um, so what they've been doing is they've been shipping, or if you like, trans-shipping some of the gas 
um, in reverse, uh, reverse order. So Ukraine has capacity to store and be the biggest storage, gas storage facilities are located in Ukraine. So they've been storing them underground in this facility and they've pumped, I think, about um, 10 billion cubic meters of gas already in, in, in there. Um, so currently Ukraine's balance, energy balance, in terms of surviving this year, this um, um, winter, um, I think they're short of about another 10 or six. So we'll see what will happen. But they've been, as I said, they've been um, um, uh, rerouting it. Some of it, Gazprom is saying this is Russian gas and this shouldn't happen. Um, you Europeans are saying this is not Russian gas, it's our gas. Um, complicated story, but to make it short, through Slovakia and Poland and Hungary are the two or three routes through which um, some of the gas has been pumped into Ukraine. It's been pumped out and pumped in, uh, which is very interesting. Um, in terms of other diversification efforts, again, most of it is not happening, and it could. Uh, current pricing mechanisms within Ukraine's energy sector do not stimulate domestic production. Actually, majority of Ukraine's domestic gas needs could have been met with just domestic production if it was competitive. But because of state subsidization, it doesn't encourage local producers to produce at all. So it's in a very Soviet system, if you know what I mean, for those of you who have any understanding of the Soviet system and how it ran. It does not in encourage production of gas domestically. So um, again, there's a group of reformers, uh, people who are in control of Nafta Gaz, which is a state company, a very competent, probably the best Ukraine has had over the last 20 years. They know what they're doing. The problem is to carry out these things. They can't do it alone. And they need support in all um, branches of the government in order to actually unbundle the sector divided into different companies, some with state ownership, some not, and that's what they're doing in order to create an opportunity for Ukraine to actually diversify its production, not just in natural gas and unconventional gas and so on, but you know, biofuels, wind energy. Ukraine has uh, lots of opportunities to, uh, to, uh, to gain alternative sources of energy if it used it, and again, if the government um, um, incentivized that greater, but that hasn't been done. The reason why it hasn't been done over the last two decades is because of particular interests that were benefiting from not just the use of and the transshipment of, of Russian gas, but actually overestimating the need that Ukraine needed. So oftentimes what you would have, uh, and when you study the needs of Ukrainian enterprises, is that the, the amount of energy that was consumed was higher than they actually needed. And it's not that they were consuming it, they were reselling it to the West, with Russia's agreement, by the way. And a lot of people benefited from it in offshore accounts. Okay, let me, um, how about Billy and then Garrett? Well, there are three groups, actually, um, and I'll highlight it because there's a, a Russian or Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church of Russian Patriarchate based in Moscow, and there's Greek Orthodox Church of Ukrainian Patriarchate that's based in Ukraine. Um, and the politics of it are, are complex, but I'll start with the Greek Catholic, which is um, Uniate Church, it's called another, in another way. This is the group that's been most marginalized during the Soviet Union. They have a very strong history of survival through Soviet repression. They were mu much more repressed than Greek Orthodox Church in Ukraine or in Russia uh, during the Soviet times. Um, they were viewed as sort of the tool of the West and so on. Um, so if, for example, uh, people who were of Greek Orthodox tradition still had some of the temples and kind of could practice um, in the villages and so on, people of, of, um, uh, of uh, sort of Greek Catholic persuasion, they had to practice, you know, clandestinely at their homes and things like that. So it was, it was a very different, they were in the underground, if you like, for a very long time. And they were the group and they still are the group that have been, I would say, articulating individual values the most in Ukraine's um, intellectual society or intelligentsia in general. And it's not that they've been um, political, and the leaders of the church are very um, 
are usually strong and try to emphasize that, that they're not political, but they do want the freedom to operate and educate minds, if you like. So they created the first um, private university in Ukraine, one of the first ones, uh, Ukrainian Catholic University, um, that sort of propounds all this idea of liberal arts college with, with, with a religious background. It's been very successful. Um, and it's not controlled by the Ministry of Education. It's, it's a very interesting, um, interesting proposition. Um, so the reason why they came out and what even the Greek Catholic Church will tell you and the leaders is that this was the action of individual priests. And we cannot tell them not to go. They are with people because people need them. And I want to also emphasize that a lot of priests of Russian uh, or Greek Orthodox of both Moscow Patriarchy and Kiev Patriarchy acted independently and were part of both, if you like, of Maidan and anti-Maidan, which is again very interesting. So this is a, you can't view them as these monolithic structures, okay? There were individual priests that were present in, in, um, in, uh, on Maidan, not just from Christian faith, but you know, there were rabbis there, there were Muslim leaders, so it was, certainly it was, religion was present on Maidan as well as one of the movements in there. Uh, but it was a very broad-based movement and not just driven by, I would say, one particular persuasion. But those who were on the, on, the, on the Maidan and were participating were acting as individuals, I would say, rather than necessarily church saying, do this or that. I hope I answered that. So, no. we have time, so we'll have to take Gary's question, and should that be the last question, or should we go? Okay, so maybe, well, Gary, we'll take your question, and then everyone who is here, I'll invite you to come on up and have a cookie, and we'll talk some more. But let's listen to Gary's question, and that is just one. Um, I've read recently that Putin has pulled quite a few troops back in Ukraine. I assume that's because of the election. Of the election. And how legitimate are those elections? Will there be a lot of Russian influence in those elections? So can we send Jimmy Carter over here to check it out? Well, there will be a lot of organizations observing it. Um, I say that probably, I mean, we're talking about the rebel hold areas, right? Um, is, so out of, um, out of 24 electoral uh, polling stations in Luhansk and Donbass, um, there won't be elections held in like 11 of them, so about half of them. So it's a big chunk of the, of the rebel areas. But in terms of the rest of Ukraine, they certainly are there. And the idea there is that there will be elections held on November 2nd, in these rebel controlled areas where they will elect their own leaders okay so they will have their kind of own elections so they won't be necessarily participating in the national election but they will do or carry out that kind of local elections of their own and so far this is what sort of the powers to be have agreed to both on the russian side and on on uh on the the western side being the us and the eu they say that these elections will be legitimate, just like the elections of the Poroshenko were, um, but not in the areas where there is currently no, um, where Kiev doesn't control them, basically. And, you know, is it legitimate or not? Again, is it a, a virtue of law, or, or are these elections also part of this whole, you know, geopolitical, when if you're recognized by external powers as legitimate, you are legitimate. And so far, Putin has not said that he will not recognize them. So I think they will be legitimate. If you take that sort of great power definition of where does legitimacy come from. Thank you so much. I want My pleasure. to say, in, um, what, if I could say one more remark, um, in addition to you know the academics that I listed who have mispredicted perhaps, I, I think it's important to make the remark that to the man and woman, every Ukrainian and Russian that I've spoken to about this has said, I could not have predicted a year ago that we would be in this situation of an undeclared war. And, um, and so this is to this serious situation where people are truly suffering. Thank you so much for sharing your understanding closer to the ground of how what people are doing and trying to, to make it better. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Nadia. Thank you for having me.